you doing? Where's your friend? <laughs> we're waiting for them. <laughs> well, I told them we weren't voting on the Uber bills today. We pulled them. <laughs> so they decided not to come. <laughs> yes. Hi, Ivan. How you doing? <coughs> Ah, si llegó Juan Manuel, está todo bien. Si llegó Juan Manuel, no hay problema. Ya, ahora puedo respirar. Thank you, my goodness. Thank you all. You scared me. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. Hi, Dave. How you doing? Hi. Good job. How you doing? Good to see you. Hola, señor. Okay, con la excusa, excusa me digo la señora. Jen, are we ready? Are our, our, our folks in the our folks in the back our folks in the back ready? Oh, wait for pixel up. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Okay, no no rush. You shaved. I like it. I've never seen you like that before. How many years? Years. Well, we decided to pull the Uber bill, so if anyone wants to leave, uh, I'm joking. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, we ready now? Yes, okay, we're gonna start, okay. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon. I want to talk about the items on today's uh, stated agenda. The council will vote on the following finance items. First, we'll vote on resolution 469, which I sponsored, which would support an additional borrowing by the Hudson Yards Infrastructure Corporation in the amount not to exceed $500 million to complete the infrastructure projects in the Hudson Yards Financing District, including phase two of the project, which includes the expansion of Hudson Boulevard and Park. The resolution would also support an undertaking by the city to pay current interest subject to appropriation to the extent not paid from revenues of the Hudson Yards Infrastructure Corporation on such Hudson Yards Infrastructure Corpora Corporation indebtedness. The council will also vote on two Article 11 property tax exemptions. 526 West 158th Street. It is for the preservation of 29 units in Council Member Mark Levine's district and 941 Rogers Place which is to preserve 20 units of affordable housing in Councilmember Rafael Salamanca's district. Uh, next, the council will vote on the following land use items. The council will vote on an application by the New York City Economic Development Corporation uh, and 14th at uh, Irving LLC to redevelop a city-owned site with a 21-story uh, focused office and retail commercial building. The building will be home to a unique cluster of workforce development organizations, which will help connect thousands of people each year with skills and training they need to connect with jobs in the new economy. I want to congratulate Councilmember Carlina Rivera on her work on this project, which has the opportunity to transform uh, uh, how we train New Yorkers for jobs in the future. And uh, I don't see her here, but if she comes, uh, I would ask her to come and speak on this item. Uh, next, the council is going to vote on the inward rezoning, of course, in Manhattan. The council will vote on this rezoning and a neighborhood plan. The plan for Inwood will result in the investment of hundreds of millions of dollars in housing, parks, and the waterfront, on schools and small businesses, job training, community services, and culture and infrastructure. I strongly believe that we have a responsibility to turn over every stone to ensure that people in this city have access to affordable housing, and I believe that Councilman Adonis Rodriguez has fought hard, as hard as anyone could have, to secure thousands of new affordable units and the commitment to preserve of thousands of existing affordable units. As a result of this rezoning and the inclusion of city-owned sites, this plan will facilitate the development of 2,600 new units of affordable housing, as well as preserve and protect 2,500 existing affordable homes. The modified plan reduces the scale of the rezoning and it removes the commercial U, which is centered around Dykeman, Broadway, and 207 streets. Councilman Rodriguez fought hard to have that taken out of the plan, commits resources for small business development, and includes a new policy to promote longer-term commercial leases with limited rent increases, all of which will help preserve the existing small business character in Inwood. The plan will include significant investments of our public school facilities and funding for an Im new immigrant research and performing arts center, which will celebrate the immigrant history of this community and of the city, while also providing much needed performing arts uh, venue for local community groups starved for such space. Finally, the plan includes millions of dollars for new and improved public parks and waterfront open space, in addition to transportation, pedestrian safety, and infrastructure upgrades. Uh, this application, of course, again, is in Council Maria Donis Rodriguez's <laughs> district. I want to thank him for getting us to this point, and I invite him to make some remarks. Thank you, Speaker. We will never get here without the support that we got from Speaker Johnson, his chief of staff, Jason, and the rest of the team from Land News, and the voices of my community. In the last 30 years, Northern Manhattan has only received less than 1,000 new affordable housing built. In the other hand, we have Vantage, Pinnacle, and many actors in the real estate community that they were pushing tenants out using a lot of tactic. I launched my campaign in 2009 in front of the building, 552 Academy, with more than a thousand violations, people without gas for five years. It took me five years and for the snowstorm to come 
and put a roof in, in almost ready to collapse in order for me to persuade the previous administration that we needed to get the capital dollar to renovate this building. This building today is 100% affordable with a 57 apartments. We are working so hard, and I can tell you that one of the pieces where we negotiated up to the last minutes with this administration was identifying some public site that in the next couple of years, if we can be able to build all the par sanitation parking garage and we can close the one at 215 in Broadway, we can build an additional 1,000 affordable housing in our community. Identifying another site where DOT site that we have at 205th Street will be closed and to relocate that DOT bridges and repair to another location where we can build an additional 6,000. We also have identified Vermilia site and NYCHA site. So all those four sites together will produce to the community more than 25 additional deeply affordable housing units. This rezoning is not about pushing tenants out. This rezoning is about investing millions of dollars on preservation. And we agree with the administration that we are adding another C code, 10040 added to 10034 this year immediately now as a priority to provide tenant legal support to our residents. But we have a plan to add the other, the other three additional C code, 10463, 10032, 10033, so that we get lawyer to all the tenants in priority to our community. This rezoning is the best thing that we can do. Of course, right now there's just a few languages that I know that uh, here, uh, the great chief of staff of the council, they also in conversation with the administration, hopefully all those little words will be resolved and we can be able to you know, move this rezoning to the floor and be able to do the one of the best rezoning in the city, building on preservation, building affordable housing, investing in education park and building the first in the nation immigrant research center performance art. Hoy es un día muy importante. Le damos la gracia al vocero del consejo. Sin él y sin su chief está no hubiésemos llegado aquí. Hacer una resonificación basada en preservación, construcción de vivienda asequible, proteger a los pequeños negocios, invertir en la educación, el arte y los parques. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, member. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Rodriguez. Uh, next up, we are going to be uh, voting on the East 33rd Street rezoning in Manhattan. The council will vote on an application by 33rd Street Acquisition LLC for a zoning map amendment to rezone nine lots within block 939 from existing R8A district to a C19A district, which is an R10A equivalent, and a zoning text amendment to establish mandatory inclusionary housing to facilitate the development of a new 23 story building, which is going to be approximately 123 thousand square feet. It's a mixed-use building located at 339 to 343 and 345 East 33rd Street, and this development is in Councilmember Carlina Rivera's district. And then lastly on land use, we're going to be voting on an item at 1019 to 1029 Fulton Street in Brooklyn. The council will vote on an application by the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development and Fulton Star LLC to make a UDAP designation, project approval, disposition approval of a city owned property at 1027 and 1029 Fulton Street, and this development is in Council Member Lori Cumbo's district. Uh, sorry, there's one more. North Conduit demapping in Queens. The council will vote on an application by Jay Siegel uh, to make a change in the city map involving the elimination, discontinuance, and closing of a portion of North Conduit Avenue between Springfield Boulevard and 144th Avenue, including the authorization or disposition of real property related thereto in Community District 13 in the Borough of Queens in connection with the operation of a of three new one-story as of right commercial buildings on a development site and this is in council member Donovan Richards district okay we're gonna move into legislation now uh, the council will vote on the following piece of legislation first is introduction uh, 1087 sponsored by council member Jumani Williams which will co-name Rogers Avenue between Par Farragut Road and Eastern Parkway as Jean-Jacques Dessaline Boulevard and uh, council member Williams isn't here to come forward and speak Next, the council will vote on introduction 965A, sponsored by Councilman Rafael Espinal, which will allow businesses uh, selling tobacco products other than
other than cigarettes that were not previously required to register for a tobacco retail dealer license, additional time to do so, and come into compliance with a law the city council passed last year to further regulate the sale of tobacco products and cut down the number of stores who sell these products. Councilmember Espinal could not join us today, but I thank him for his work on this bill. Finally, the council will vote on legislation to regulate the for hire vehicle industry in New York City. This legislation has received a lot of attention the last few weeks, and I want to clarify a few things. Number one, we are not taking away any service that is currently being offered to customers in New York City, people that seek uh, on an app to get a for hire vehicle. We are not diminishing or decreasing the number of licenses or vehicles on the road. We are pausing the issuance of new licenses in an industry that has been allowed to proliferate with e without any appropriate check or regulation. And if anyone wants to put a new wheelchair accessible vehicle on the road during the next 12 months, they can do so. As many wheelchair accessible vehicles as they want, they can put on the road during this 12 month pause. In fact, we encourage them to do that because there are far too uh, few wheelchair accessible vehicles on the road. This is about careful deliberation. The Taxi and Limousine Commission is going to study this issue. And this is about supporting and uplifting drivers, making sure they are paid enough to support themselves and their families. This is a plan that we came up with and in my heart, I believe it is the best path forward. Uh, our goal has always been to protect drivers, bring fairness to the industry, and do our best to reduce congestion, or at least not add to it. That's what this proposal does, and it represents the broad outlines of what we think our next step should be in this city to help uh, the industry. Introduction 838C would add a new license for high volume for hire, for hire, for hire transportation services serving over 10,000 trips a day, Introduction 958A would remove enhanced financial penalties for unauthorized street hails in the hail exclusionary zone to bring them in line with penalties citywide. Both of these bills were sponsored by Councilmember Ruben Diaz Sr. and he is the chair of the 4 Hire Vehicle uh, Committee, so I would ask him to speak on these pieces of legislation. Thank you, Mr. P Speaker. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the Bible said that without vision, my people will perish. And we, in January, we started with a new leader. We started with, with a man with a vision, with a man that knew the suffering, a man that knew how taxi drivers were treated, and a man that saw how taxi drivers would, would, were uh, killing themselves. So with a, with a man with a vision, we uh, created, that man with a vision created a new committee, a committee to deal with these problems. And that man put his trust on me and gave me that committee to, to chair. And today I could say that, Mr. Speaker, your vision has come through. Uh, the instruction that you gave me to follow, I follow to the, to the, to the letter. And today we have uh, an opportunity to make history in the nation. Uh, New, York being, New York City being the first city of making, of being the one that regulate Uber. Regulate Uber and capping is two different things. So you gotta be, be clear. Regulate Uber is another bill. Mm -hmm. And capping is another bill. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we're gonna regulate Uber and we, we're going to make history in the city of New York. And Uber is throwing mm, cars every two months, 2,000 2, vehicles to the street, about 80,000 vehicles already, and, 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 and no, no regulation. Uber is, you, you think Uber is a taxi? Uber is not a taxi. We, we don't even know what Uber is. It's not a taxi, it's a taxi, we don't even know. Now we're going we're gonna to regulate Uber, and Uber is going to be regulated and it's going to be a taxi industry like anybody else, like the yellow, like the green, like the black, like the like, like livery. And by the way, I'm going to end with this, Mr. Speaker. You know, they're using those uh, scare tactics that our community, the chopper and the black and Hispanic, you know, they're always using black and Hispanic for their benefit. Even every time that you want people 
to do something, they use our suffering, black and Hispanic suffering to, 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 to do their, uh, for their benefit. Everybody, everybody cares. Everyone in the city of New York cares about black and Hispanic. And when I was in Albany and they needed money for education, they took buses of black and Hispanic children to Albany. See, we got to be sure that black and Hispanic, the money never gets to our community. When they need housing, oh, we're going to do it for black and Hispanic. Every now, Uber, black and Hispanic. By the way, you know that the same livery that now we, we find, because they pick up, we are telling delivery drivers in our community, you cannot pick up because you want to get fined. Even $10,000 fine, to, today we're lowering that down. But if you pick up a, a passenger in the black and Hispanic community, we are telling deliveries, we're going to find you. Then Uber take the same livery, take the same car, the same livery, and send that car to pick up. So for Uber, it's okay for the livery to pick up, but for delivery, it's not okay to pick up. Please give me a break. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> You sure you finished? I did. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Introduction uh, 634B, which is sponsored by, again, uh, Chair Diaz Sr. and uh, Councilmember Adonis Rodriguez, would waive the licensing fees for accessible taxi cabs and for hire vehicles to promote uh, their use. I forgot to ask you if you wanted to speak on that bill. So if you want to no, speak. No, no, I, Mr. Good. Mr. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I want to be, I want to make sure, I am a soldier here. I'm a soldier. He is the leader. He told me, you're the chairman of the committee, go work when you're ready, bring to me whatever you got. I did that. It's up to me. <laughs> Councilman Rodriguez. <laughs> well, thank you, Chair, uh, uh, Speaker Johnson and Chairman Diaz. You know, I feel that we are arriving to the day or something that we started years ago, which is to level the playing field of the taxi industry in the city of New York. We always say that in a city where we have 65 million tourists last year and an 8.5 million population, there's opportunity for everyone. But everything is about how do we establish, you know, a, a similar a rule and regulation to everyone. So with this bill and many others that we have in this package, but we're aiming it to be sure that the industry provide good services to everyone, that the industry, they are being shown that they are more responsible to provide the services at the same time that also we show that we care not only for the industry, but most important for the consumers and the drivers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excuse me. And then, uh, uh, I think there is one more bill in this package. Uh, two, 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 two more two, bills. Two, There's two more bills in this package. Big, 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 yeah. big support. Yes. Introduction 144B, sponsored by Councilmember Steve Levin, would require the Taxi and Limousine Commission to study and decide whether to adopt vehicle utilization standards or regulations on the number of for hire vehicle licenses. During this one year study, there pause on the, issu the issuance of new for hire vehicle licenses with an exception for wheelchair accessible vehicles. The TLC would also be able to issue new licenses if it determines there is a need in a particular geographic area and there isn't a substantial effect on congestion. I want to invite uh, Steve to come up and speak on this bill. Thank you, Speaker. Um, so I just want to acknowledge uh, the great work that Speaker Johnson and Chair Diaz have put into uh, bringing this, uh, this package of bills uh, here to the Council today. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, our Transportation Chair, uh, Adonis Rodriguez, who uh, back in 2015, we worked very closely together uh, the last time that this legislation was considered. And um, you know, what has changed since then? is that we've seen about a doubling in the number of for hire vehicles on our streets. And uh, went from about 67,000 uh, at the time to now around 130,000. And um, that has carried with it significant impacts. Uh, it's impacted congestion throughout New York City. Um, it, it's common sense. We see it out there with our own two eyes. Um, uh, it's in the Central Business District. It's also in neighborhoods like the one that I represent in uh, Greenpoint and Williamsburg. All you have to do is drive down uh, White Avenue on a Saturday night uh, and, and see the congestion there. Um, but it's also, uh, 
it set off a, a very alarming uh, situation among drivers and their ability to make a living. Uh, in, you know, for generations, uh, immigrants had come to New York City and they could drive a cab, uh, a yellow cab or a livery car, and, and be able to, uh, to make it, to make a middle class living. Uh, to be able to provide for their families, to be able to maybe buy a home, um, to be able to send their children to college. And uh, over the last several years, what we've seen is a significant decrease in that quality of life. And recent articles uh, in the New York Times, uh, the, uh, an opinion piece in the Daily News yesterday, um, from the driver's perspective, from a app-based for hire vehicle driver perspective has shown that it is almost impossible to make a living, to make a decent living in New York City to be able to afford your rent and your groceries and your medical bills and the insurance on your car and the repairs to your car. All of those things have become uh, increasingly difficult because there are so many cars on the road that it's, it's hard to find a fare. If you're a driver, you might drive around for an hour or two looking for a fare, and drivers have seen that their, uh, their monthly wage uh, you know, go down significantly, um, you know, or a, a weekly uh, wage that uh, uh, before they have to pay out all of their expenses, you know, maybe $1,000, and then they have to pay the insurance, they gotta pay the gas, they've gotta pay to replace their transmission, and so on and so forth. So intro 144 presses the pause button so that TLC can set meaningful policy moving forward around, uh, around the utilization rate that is uh, most optimal for cars. Uh, right now, uh, around 40% of the time, cars are driving around without a passenger. And uh, all of the app-based companies can actually control that utilization rate. They can ensure that that utilization rate go up, and as the recent uh, uh, study that was commissioned by the TLC shows, uh, that will have a significant impact. But we need to make sure that right now we're pressing the pause button as that is underway. And um, you know, I think that these bills uh, uh, work very well. This bill works very well with the other bills that are in this legislative package. That's where Landers' bill, which you'll speak about. Uh, Count, uh, Chair Diaz's bill, uh, Councilman Rodriguez's bill, uh, to, uh, to kind of provide a comprehensive solution here where we're raising the quality of life, um, but we're also um, uh, ensuring that the situation doesn't get any worse, that the situation doesn't deteriorate. Um, and, and so I, I think that this is a responsible piece of legislation. I really want to commend Speaker Johnson, Chair Diaz, um, Councilmember Rolander, Councilmember Rodriguez, but also uh, the council staff, so Jason Goldman, Laura Popa, the entire uh, staff of the Fort Hire Vehicle Committee, which I will give a shout out, James D. Giovanni, uh, Jason Maserano, Emily Rooney, Rick Arbello, Chima Abisher, and John Basile, as well as the legislative drafting unit for working on these bills, Christopher Lynn, uh, the council to Fort Hire Vehicle Committee, as well as all the advocates that have worked on this. So. Uh, there's many to, to name, but uh, the Taxi Worker Alliance, Beta V Desai, IDG, uh, TLC Chair Mayor Joshi, and Jeff Lynch from the administration. Um, uh, we're trying to do the right thing here. We're trying to ensure that people can make a living here in New York City um, and, uh, and, and do good work uh, in a res and, 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 uh, and make the city a better place. So I want to thank all my colleagues, Speaker. Thank you very much for the time and look forward to the vote on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thanks, Steve. And the last bill in this package is a very important bill, and I'm really proud of Councilmember Brad Lander for introduction 890B, which would require the TLC to set minimum payments for for hire vehicle drivers for trips dispatched by high volume for hire vehicle services. The TLC would also be required to study payments for other for hire vehicle trips and study whether the TLC should set minimum rates of fare. Uh, this is a big deal. This is gonna help countless, countless drivers in New York City who have been struggling. Uh, congratulations, Brad. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to add my voice to the comments first that, that Steve made. I really think um, that Corey, Chair Diaz, Steve, uh, Idanis, I'm proud today to be part of the team that put this package of legislation together. Of course, there has been a lot of noise out there in the apps and on social media and in the media, um, and, you know, led us by the spending of millions of dollars by a set of companies with a very specific corporate interest. But if you look at what has happened here, at the process that the speaker established, at the research that has been done, at the listening that has been done, this is the kind of process you want in local democracy. And I am really confident that we are getting the balance right on Uber and Lyft to address plummeting driver pay, escalating congestion, a real need for more accessible vehicles, and still ensuring high quality service for New Yorkers in so many communities who need it. And we really don't take that lightly. I know so many people who have come to rely on, for whom the apps have actually been real life changers, game changers, in their ability to get around. And look, you know, I'm a white guy in a tie. I do not know the indignity of standing there with my hand up having cars drive by. We take it really seriously. We want good service for New Yorkers in all the communities of New York City. And the package of legislation that we are passing today gets the balance right. It will preserve and even, I believe, strengthen good service, certainly for New Yorkers with disabilities, but I believe for others as well, while addressing those fundamental issues of plummeting pay, of growing congestion, of accessibility. Intro 890B will make New York City the first city in the country to guarantee a living wage for Uber and Lyft and for hire vehicle drivers. Um, and that's a big deal. Um, credit goes also to the Taxi and Limousine Commission and to James Parrott and Mike Reich for that study, which if you didn't dig into is worth digging in a little bit if you're writing about this today. It's an extensive look at this issue that found the two thirds of FHV drivers are driving full time. This is their way of making a living. They are not doing it as a side hustle. They are full time overwhelmingly immigrants, 85% are not earning a living wage. And let's remember they gotta pay their taxes, they gotta pay their expenses, they're not getting sick days, they're not getting health insurance, they're not getting disability. 40% of them are eligible for Medicaid. That's where we are. We have uh, tens of thousands of workers who are working hard every day um, and they're working in poverty. And why? Because the number of cars has gone up so much, 500% increase in FHVs over the last couple of years. And that means on average, and the report actually goes through each of the different app companies, but on average they're empty now about 40% of the time, which of course makes sense when you know that we went from 15,000 of those cars to 80,000 of those cars. So it's not surprising they're spending more time driving around empty chasing fares and not earning anything. So the requirement for Uber and Lyft to now start paying an hourly living wage that accounts for that empty time is a win-win-win. It means the drivers will earn a living wage, but it also gives Uber and Lyft incentive to reduce the percent of time those cars are empty and increase the percent of times that they have a fare. And that means we get better service. That's an incentive to put cars in the communities where they're needed and where people are waiting. It's good for drivers and it reduces congestion. It really is gonna have, I believe, a significantly positive impact across all the goals uh, that we have here. Um, I'll just make two concluding points. First, I think it's actually the first time that any jurisdiction in the country has set a living wage for gig economy workers of any kind. And as the, we're starting to see the future of work, of more independent work, of more freelance work, something uh, that the speaker and I have done a lot of work together on and hope to do more on, that we're saying, you know, we see the ways that the world of work is evolving and with more and more people categorized as freelancers or independent contractors, they've got to earn a living wage too. Plenty of people in this room have spent time there. Um, I'm proud that we're becoming the first city in the country to say independent workers have got to be able to earn a living wage and here's a creative way to make it happen. Um, and then finally, I just want to underline the accessibility provision a little more because I had been talking about it incorrectly um, because I had been saying that the percentage of accessible vehicles was uh, embarrassingly low because it was in the single digits. Uh, and it was only this morning I realized we're not even in the single digits. 0.5% of the four hire vehicles are accessible to people 
uh, with wheelchairs. It is an embarrassingly low rate of service. There is a consent decree that Uber and Lyft and the other four hire vehicle companies have signed in court that commits them to dramatically increase the number of cars that are out there for people uh, in wheelchairs. So for, for them to argue simultaneously that the sky is falling because there's no room for growth, while the TLC actually has provisions if there actually is a problem, and while they have committed to take us up from that embarrassingly low 0.5 percent to something credible that would move toward equal service, um, is just one more falsehood that has been spread there, and I think it's important for people to hear in this context. Thank you very much Thank for you. the time, Mr. Speaker. Congratulations, Brad. Uh, so that concludes uh, what is on today's agenda, and I'm happy to take questions first on these topics, and then we can do off-topic and other stuff afterwards. Juan Manuel. Uh, Speaker, you are imposing this cap or pause uh, on a day where thousands or dozens, tens of thousands of New Yorkers were stranded by the subway system again today, like getting here today took forever for many of us. Um, what would you tell to all those who see Uber, Lyft, and all these SHVs as something that they really need because the subway system in the city doesn't work? Well, the, uh, it's unacceptable, of course, any day, and especially today, where I heard that uh, many journalists who were trying to come here, as well as many just New Yorkers, folks that work here at the council, actually, uh, had a hard time getting here this morning. And so the subway crisis is unacceptable. It's unabating. Uh, I would love to see the subway action plan take effect and start to show some rescue and action for strap hangers. But there, it's not, I think, a, a fair characterization to think that uh, to solve or get ourselves out of the crisis in the subway system is through more cars on the road. I mean, there, there are millions of people who take the subway every single day. I think it's six million New Yorkers take the subway every single day. So if you tried to solve the subway crisis, by putting more for hire vehicle licenses on the road, that is not a rational or sound policy way to get out of that. The subway system is a, is a different question, which I'm happy to talk about, uh, but today is us saying the number of licenses on the road, as Councilmember Lander just pointed out, uh, the vehicles that are on the road, 40% of the time they're sitting empty. So today is about saying you're still gonna have about over 100,000 for hire vehicles on the road, we're gonna create utilization rates to fill them with people who need them, to work with the for hire vehicles, hopefully, on their algorithms and how they fill those fares in a more efficient, uh, maximal way. And we believe that we're gonna hit the pause button for the next 12 months as we look at this complicated issue while still allowing some, I think, pretty significant exemptions on an unlimited amount of wheelchair accessible vehicles and if the four hire vehicle companies, which are gonna to report to us on a quarterly basis, uh, the number of uh, uh, rides that are requested, if they see in a particular geographic area, whether it's Bed-Stuy or Williamsburg or Soundview or Jackson Heights, that they need more vehicles on the road in those areas, they can get that from the TLC. Steve, did you wanna say anything uh, on this? Uh well, just as the speaker said, that uh, we don't anticipate that this is going to decrease service in any in any way. Uh, really, the key is going to be to try to maximize or optimize the utilization. Um, but uh, you know, I think it's pretty clear, and the data is showing that um, really what we're seeing is just cars driving around empty right now. And so, um, I think that New Yorkers can rest assured that they're, that they're, the service that they're depending on now, if they're depending on an Uber or a Lyft. That's not going anywhere. We're not, uh, we're not uh, taking uh, cars off the road, and we're not going after any company in particular or any type of service in particular. We're just saying that the exponential growth that we've seen um, has, has actually oversaturated uh, the market, and the data shows that. And so this is just providing a temporary cap uh, so, that the, um, so that it doesn't get any worse, really. Do you mind clarifying that provision that the speaker was talking about? Um, Well, so, so someone would have to, uh, or a company or an uh, individual, if they own a car, uh, a license, they want to uh, apply for a new license, uh, saying that there's been a significant impact 
to uh, a community as it relates to uh, wait times uh, or availability of cars, and it, we're able to show that it won't increase congestion, or they're able to show that it won't increase congestion, then the TLC will consider that. But they'd have to make a compelling case. Uh, you know, I, I don't think um, the addition of 15 or 30 seconds in average wait time in a, in a community would would really warrant you know adding more licenses. Um, and really, that's what we're you know when we look at like what the impact will be, marginal like that. Uh, Brad and then Reverend Diaz, if you wanted to say something as well on this. To this, I just want to add that the framework being established today could be very well integrated with congestion pricing, something that the Speaker has supported in the past, that many of us have supported in the past, and because we believe that is a fundamental way to provide the revenue needed to implement the Fast Forward Plan, the study this whole next year, all the additional data that we're going to have, and the framework will then that will then ultimately be established for the regulation going forward, we would be thrilled to integrate that with a thoughtful approach to broader congestion pricing. You know that we can't decide that in the room, in this room by ourselves upstairs, um, but it's wholly consistent. I mean, getting at driver pay, getting at congestion, getting at accessibility has to be done through TLC regulation, but connecting that to a broader plan to raise the revenues to fix the subways, they would go beautifully together. We'll need Albany to take action to do that. Uh, let, sure, let, let, yeah. uh, Juan Manuel, let me tell you that there is no reason for why, why people have to wait. There are thousands and thousands of cars out there. Liveries. You know how many liveries we have? We got hundreds of thousands. We have so many thousand cars, liveries, that they are telling them you cannot pick up people. So why don't we all work out? Livery drivers are minorities. Livery drivers are uh, uh, foreigners. They are the, the, uh, immigrants. Liberty drivers are black, Hispanic, but we are we are stopping them from working and pick up the people so people could go like that. So why don't we, instead of be criticizing what we're doing, why don't we all join forces and help the delivery, re, uh, relieve the deliveries, so our people won't suffer anymore? Is that going to be next Sunday's mission? Uh, listen, listen. The speaker gave me this committee. We remember, like, like Brad uh, and, and like, like, like Levin and a council and a, and a, a councilor like, like Christopher Lee. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, first, the bill also includes you know, the study that the TLC commissioned only so far looked at the, the, the app-based FHVs. And we have to, in all of these bills, it's been necessary to make sure that we have the rational basis and it survives court scrutiny to do good studies. So extending the, the pay regulation to liveries requires the additional study, and that study is in the bill. And I think our goal is to make it so that all drivers across all sectors of the TLC earn a living wage. So that is our goal. And I think in the meantime, um, you know, obviously drivers are evaluating constantly uh, what their opportunities are. This council actually acted to make sure they could do that through universal license. Um, if the consequence of what this happens is that those livery bases need to raise their pay a little sooner than the TLC makes them to in order to be competitive and keep their drivers, that seems like a good thing to me and not a bad one. Yep. There's a, a $200 million direct investment. There's all the, all the investment that the administration is committed to do this time around that we are not counting as part of that rezoning investment, like the $85 million to upgrade, to renovate the waterfront.
from 157 to Dagnan Street have been announced as a commission of silver uh, two weeks ago, but we are not counting those 85 million dollars as a direct rezoning. We are counting the direct rezoning, the 50 million to the George Washington, the 50 million to build a pier, new pier, uh, uh, the, the like $50 million to build the Immigrant Research Center Performance Arts. So I can say directly and indirectly, there's around 500 million, but when it comes to what is the number that we are getting directly from the rezoning, is more than 200 million. Um, let me, we can keep going back, okay, Emma. I think what we've seen is major, major upheaval in the industry and uh, explosive growth that has affected all areas, it's affected uh, drivers' lives, not just yellow drivers' lives, but Uber drivers' lives, as we've seen from these op-ed pieces and rallies about how it's affected them. We've seen uh, some effect on congestion. We don't think this is the primary source of congestion, but it has exacerbated it in some way. And uh, we've, we basically, uh, you know, these high volume for hire vehicle companies um, saw something and I don't begrudge them for it. They saw an exception when they really came into the market years ago where they could get a certain type of license and really grow in, in an explosive way without a regulatory framework being put in place to handle that level of growth. And in the last three years, when this was last considered, and in the summer of 2015, there has been such an explosive rate of growth, and we have seen the real human effects um, on all drivers and on the city as a whole. We've tried to come up with what we think is a fair, rational, sound public policy solution to this. And part of that public policy solution is getting more data. It's, it's saying we don't have all the answers right now, but we seek to get those answers so we get more decisions down the line. So I think that's really what has changed in the last uh, three years. And I think if you talk to the CEO of Uber, uh, Dara, and I'm not saying his last name because I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, um, Dara Kay, I think you would, you would hear from him that he's talked about uh, changing the culture of Uber, which has, um, you know, there have been some bad moments for them around the world over the last few years. And I think he has come in to say, let's do things differently. And, um, you know, Uber and Lyft may not be saying this uh, publicly on the record, but they were very much involved in this entire process. They were, they were stakeholders at the table. They were talked to dozens and dozens and dozens of times. The language was shared with them. They had a seat at the table. Uh, there were things that other folks wanted to put in and through conversations with them were not included. So they, they were real full stakeholders in this. And that's how we do things here. We're not doing this in a punitive way. As Brad said, we we're trying to come up with a fair, a fair way uh, to handle this moving forward. Uh, other, other cities around the world, uh, good luck. <laughs> it's been a fun uh, few months. No, I mean, these are complicated issues. And every city's different because the dynamic in every city's different. It depends on the transportation network. It depends on the number of vehicles coming into the city. It depends on if they have a congestion pricing scheme. It depends on the level of mass transit. It depends on uh, density in those cities. It depends on a lot of things. Uh, New York is the best city, I believe, in the world. And we have some enormous challenges that we have to face. And that's why we need congestion pricing. Dana. Uh, I, I, my conversation with the Daily News was an on-the-record conversation, and I, I had a great conversation with them, but I think I said something slightly more nuanced um, to them, though I, I really loved the editorial today uh, from the Daily News. I think what I said was slightly more nuanced was, 
I can't prejudge what's gonna happen 12 months from now because it's really gonna be data driven. But I believe that given the data that we have so far, if we can maximize utilization rates, if we can bring that 60% number above 80%, 85%, 90% through working with the four hire vehicle companies, with the vehicles on the road, with natural attrition that occurs on its own, and we put together a sound framework, you may not need a hard license cap because you could do something through a utilization cap. But what I said was, I can't prejudge what's gonna happen here with the, with the legislative process here at the council, with what the TLC is gonna determine through getting those numbers and through us getting uh, quarterly uh, reports. So, um, so that's sort of, a, I guess, a more contextual way of what I was saying uh, to them yesterday. On the dominance of the market, I'm happy to let, I mean, I'm happy to speak on this, but I also wanna let uh, you know, Steve or, or the chair or, or Brad or Yodana speak on this uh, because it's come up a lot. Um, so I would say that you know, right now, my understanding is within the FHV market, Uber has about 80% of the market share, uh, Lyft has something like 10 or 15, and then Juno is a little bit less than that, and then it kind of goes from there. Um, you know, I don't know if there's anything that we could do to impact that one way or another. Um, that's, those are kind of broader market forces within, um, within this market itself. So, like, if you were to look at it, so a lot of drivers, if you, you, you know, uh, uh, talk to a FHV driver, they'll use all the apps. Uh, I was out earlier today, I saw a, a lot of smaller cars actually using, had Via in their back window. So there's, you know, Via normally we think of as a van-based uh, company. But, um, so, so drivers are making decisions about which app to use, and they're using different apps for different trips. They could be using, you know, they could be on one trip using uh, Uber, the next trip using Lyft, the next trip using Juno. One might offer a more competitive uh, commission rate. Um, one has a greater reason, you know, number of, of uh, potential customers. And so, um, you know, that is, that's the marketplace right there at work. I don't know whether there's anything that we're, we would do here to impact market share, because keep in mind, a license might be through an Uber subsidiary, which a lot of them are, um, but that doesn't mean that those drivers aren't using Juno or, or Lyft at any given time. Go ahead, Dana, if you want to follow up. My original oh, bill was eight pages. So to tell you that we are trying to cooperate and to, to understand everyone, my original bill were eight pages. Then we cut it to six. Then we cut it to five. Then we went back to six. But it's no longer eight pages. We took away things to be able that everyone uh, were included and that we consulted with everyone. So I, I believe that what we're doing now is the right thing to do. And someone asked a question before I say, what changed everything now and not before? We have a different speaker. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, back to Inwood real quick, uh, Councilmember Rodriguez. What is your direct response to people in the community that are confirmed, uh, are concerned despite all the additional affordable housing that's been promised, all of this rezoning, all of this renovation, all of this work will affect the free market pricing so much that you're still pricing a lot of low and middle income folks out of the community. That, first of all, we're listening to the community. And we made a decision that I personally didn't agree, but we wanted to give something to those who were raising voices on the position to include you at the rezoning. I believe that by, you know, it was a big ask from board presidents, all the elected officials, the voices of the Inwood Preservation Group, and those who say, if we rezone, including the U, mean Dykeman from Nago to Broadway, Broadway from Dykeman to 207, 207 from Nago to Broadway, it will be too much to the community. I personally believe that it was a good thing to do the rezoning, including the U, because by taking the U out, what we are doing is not putting a limit on how high, and anyone in the type of rezoning that we have so far, they can build as high as they want to. 
depending on how they use the square feet. So we're listening to the community, uh, not only when it comes to downside the, the area for the rezoning, but also we listen to the community. The community say, well, we will get on uh, the inclusionary, mand mandatory inclusionary housing is not enough. And that's what we fought so hard to get those four additional commitment in a process that in the next couple of years, we can see construction or affordable housing happening in those four sites. Yes, in those four sites that I mentioned, we can add an additional 2,500 affordable housing. So I believe that what we are doing today is acting responsible, saying that the community could not control how tenants being pushed out for 30 years unless we build affordable housing and we invest on preservation. And investing on education in this plan, we had a commitment from the administration that more resources will be invested to provide algebra for all to all middle school with a transition of algebra from elementary to middle school. In this agreement, it is agreed that the administration will be working with us to build a new PTEC a two-year college focused on engineering and mechatronic. So I feel that at the end of the day, there's gonna be a good rezoning that will allow to build affordable housing and preserve more of those regulated apartments since we have in community board 12, the largest number of regulated apartments in the whole state of New York. It is our responsibility to preserve those affordable. No one can be pushed out if they live in a regulated apartments. The only way or how can protect them if we bring money to provide lawyers to those things. Julia? Yeah. Uh, sure. I mean, there's no silver bullet, I think, to completely uh, resolve the major, major congestion problems which have gotten worse and have been exacerbated over the last three years, five years, and seven years. I think congestion pricing is kind of the biggest legislative policy thing we could do to work on that issue. I also think that uh, looking at uh, scheduling overnight deliveries on uh, for retailers, especially large-scale retailers that have the larger trucks, the tractor-trailer trucks, of potentially doing deliveries between nine o'clock at night and five o'clock in the morning would be a good step. You know, this is not gonna solve congestion, but logically, if you're adding 2,000 new vehicles to the road every single month, and you hit pause on that while you study the effects, I think it will have some small effect, not a large effect, which is why, I can't speak for all of us up here, but I think all of us who are here today uh, support congestion pricing. Um, and, and, you know, we think that's the biggest thing that could be done to solve that issue in the city. Anyone else on anything on topic? Samar. Before you, go, before you continue, yes. name me one. Name yeah, just name me one. I mean, I can just, you say the last donation to me, name me one. I mean, it's, it's, on, it's in the records. Uh, so name me one. No fake news. Name me, name me one. And then I will answer you. Oh, you want me to pull it up? Thank you. Well, you already let me know. Sure, sure. I mean, you can go to someone else. Uh, Juan Manuel. I believe that Uber, I believe that Uber, Live, Via, and the other 72 are companies that we have in the city, they will be doing well. I believe with the number of vehicles that Uber has so far and live today, they have enough to provide the services that consumer needs. We need to add here as a council, and that's what the speaker and the chairman is doing, and the rest of us is thinking about the consumers, the drivers, and everyone else. So as a former liberal taxi that I was, I feel that what we're doing the best thing today, level the playing field for everyone. Estoy diciendo de que yo creo que la, con el liderazgo del speaker, el chairman Díaz también y todos nosotros,
como un taxista que yo fui, yo entiendo de que hoy estamos tratando de nivelar las mismas reglas y regulaciones que deben de seguir todos los que participan en la industria de taxi, desde los de, 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 de Uber, Lyft, Vía, otras 72 compañías más, los Black Car, eh, los Libre, pero tenemos que proteger a los consumidores y a los taxistas, especialmente la parte latina, que juega un papel importante siendo dueño de bases y manejando la industria de taxi en esta ciudad. So we're going to open up to off topic. If members want to stay, they can. If you want to go, you can. It's up to you. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. I just want to follow up on my yeah. colleague's question about the donations to the tax. No, no. We're going to talk about that. That's. Uh, well, that, yeah. that council member asked us to keep more than $11,000 in the right. tax district, 40, mm -hmm. 40 to 50 million. Right. So we're going to the council to tell us their homes for us to I don't have the facts on it. So if you're telling me they're $11,000. Yeah, okay. okay. I, that's, that's that. I, I'm. I'm I'm not disputing the reporting. Well, I guess my original question was... Okay, I'm happy to answer the question. You created a committee for him, which he pushed for. Yes. Are you not worried about the perception that that creates of conflict? As well as, is it, is it appropriate for him to say, take Uber, it's going to be like reporting? I'm not going to... I don't use the word fake news. Uh, but, uh, But... You know, if I spent every day trying to tell the 50 members of the council what they should and shouldn't say, I would be here a long time. But I, but I will, I will talk to you about the issue of uh, the chairman having the committee and the $11,000. If that's what's if the fact is, uh, uh, whatever the number is, I will address that. I don't think that. Uh, let me finish first, and then you can answer. So, I don't think that anything we're doing today. Um, is a giveaway to the yellow taxi industry. I don't think anything in these bills is something, I don't know who these contributors were. Uh, so I can't, I can't tell you what their connection is, if they were large medallion owners, individual medallion owners, I don't know who these individuals are. But, I, but none of the policy concerns and decisions we made on the, on the pause bill, on the driver bill, on the accessibility bill, on the fine reduction bill for illegal street hails, none of that, uh, and all the conversations I had with all the colleagues here, involved any consideration of how we're going to benefit certain people. We were trying to come up with a regulatory framework that made sense. I don't believe that in any of my conversations with the chair, and we had many conversations on this issue, that he was ever attempting in any conversation I had with him to try to do something for a particular sector of the industry. The sense I had in all of my conversations with him from the very beginning of the year was he believed that drivers were being hurt around the city, and we were seeing that through tragic suicides, heartbreaking suicides. And what I kept hearing from him is people are losing their lives, livery drivers and yellow drivers and even Uber drivers and their families are suffering greatly. And he had, I think, uh, you know, he was very vigorous in pushing me, when can we do something to get something done to protect drivers, protect drivers, protect drivers. So that is what all of my conversations were like. There are many people in New York City uh, who have interests in the city, whether they be real estate developers or uh, people in the taxi industry or people who work for contractors or construction, and they make campaign contributions, uh, which is what the system allows right now. I can tell you here at the council, on all the bills we voted on in the last you know, seven and a half months, nothing has been affected by campaign contributions uh, and all the deliberations that we've done from my perspective and all the bills we've moved forward. So even if it is the case that he received contributions in the past, I don't believe that those contributions affected the final product of the bills in this package of legislation. Mr. Speaker, and to the gentleman here, when I say what I said, I maybe I jump ahead of time. I never received a donation for the, from Yellow Cap, not from Uber, not from Leaf, not from none of those companies. Yes, the delivery drivers. Yeah. We're we hurting deliveries. We're not hurting we, I mean, what we're doing. We're trying to protect everyone to level the field. So yes, yes, I'm interested. I, say, I am, in, Mr. The, Bigger, the, the, Mr. Bigger, Mr. Bigger, I am interested in helping the drivers. But I want to say I, one thing: the, the cap that we're talking about applies to liveries as well. Okay. So the bill applies to liveries. So, so my concern here, my main concern, is helping those 
delivery drivers, and those drivers that have been exploded by everyone, by the insurance companies, by the bases, by Uber and Lyft and all those things that use them, and then they pay nothing to them. They, are, they use their, their cars, they pay their insurance, they pay their uh, gas, everything, and Uber gets the money. So, yes, I am very concerned because they are, they are my people there. I am very concerned in helping them. So, I've got to be, and whoever knows me, knows me that I don't work on the pressure, no matter how much pressure you put on me and how much you do, when I believe into something, I believe into something. And the pressure and the, the, the picketing and all those things, that doesn't work on me. I am, I am an honest person. I'm going to help the drivers. I asked the speaker when I came, let me help the driver. And I want to work for the drivers. Yes. One thing. Just, just one thing to add on that. So, I've been the sponsor of this bill, 144, in its previous iteration for three and a half years. Um, I don't, to the best of my recollection, I don't think I've gotten a single contribution in my 20, uh, in my 2017 account from anyone associated with the for hire vehicle or livery or taxi industry whatsoever. I don't even have a 2021 20, account. So, uh, and I've, and I was involved in, every word of this bill. I, I, you know, every single word of this bill uh, I had to uh, either put forward or sign off on, and it was a, through a lot of negotiations with a lot of interested parties, never, not, not a single issue around campaign, I don't even have a campaign committee, so. I mean, I feel very, very comfortable in everything that's in these bills. We were painstaking about the details, we talked to all the stakeholders, and I never felt once, through any of my conversations with the chair, with Steve, with Adonis, or with Brad, that we were doing anything based off of trying to help out a individual person or donor, that's not what happened here. Okay, uh, Dana. I, I, I hope that the chair of uh, the committee and the TLC chair can get together and have a good productive working relationship moving forward. Yes, let me finish first. Uh, that I hope that they will sit down, have a mutually respectful relationship uh, and how they interact with each other because these issues are clearly so important and affect so many individual lives and lives of consumers across the city. So uh, the chair knows that I believe that. Um, I have a great relationship with the commissioner. I think she's done a fabulous job. Uh, she has been a real partner in this process uh, with all of us here at the council, with the staff. She has spent overtime working on this, seven days a week, taking phone calls at any hour of any day. So I am really grateful for everything she's done. And she's gonna be, she's gonna be a very, very important person, as well as the staff at the TLC, on how we continue to make sound public policy decisions on this dynamic, industry that is changing all the time moving forward. So I think there'll be a lot of collaboration between the staff at the council and the staff at the TLC, as well as, I hope, respectful collaboration between myself, the other members, the chair, and the commissioner, because it is vitally important that we get this right, which is why, again, I want to just hit this point home again. There were things that a lot of stakeholders were asking us to mandate in these bills, which we didn't do. We put forward, study it, study it, get data, give quarterly reports, study it, because we didn't want to make a mistake. We didn't want to do something which we thought was the right thing to do, but then it was going to have an adverse impact, and then it would be more difficult to go back and change that later on. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of collaboration, and I also think one thing that the TLC is going to need is they're going to need a, probably a significant increase in their budget moving forward to be able to implement all of this and handle this in the, in the most appropriate way. Did you want to comment on this, no, uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Speaker, that the, 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 the TLC Commission asked every time that we talk to her why the drivers have been summoned, why are they summoned so much, why have they been persecuted, why are they being entrapped and tramping uh, in, 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 in the minority communities. She said, that's the city council. She asked for the power. She asked for the authority to fix the problem. We are giving her the authority to fix the problem. 
So what is what could we do? We're giving a doctor the sign. Yeah, go ahead, and I'll just add here that, you know, the, I think we already are seeing that level of deep collaboration. The report that she commissioned from Parrott and Reich is influencing a lot of these bills. So the driver pay bill comes directly from research that they authorized. And this nexus between, like, they need to have data. A lot of us actually went and supported their getting some of this data by rule earlier. They need to have the data. They do the analysis. We make the laws. Like, this is a collaborative process already, and I'm confident. Okay, we only have a few more minutes, so I'm going to go to Monica. Well, I want to thank Frank Runyon from City and State for his really uh, important uh, expose on the lack of inspections and what was being found in water tanks uh, all across NYCHA buildings all around the city, whether it be dead pigeons or squirrels or rats or contaminated water um, or objects in the in these. It's unacceptable, totally unacceptable, and it adds to the growing list of issues at NYCHA from uh, lead paint to heat and not water outages to elevators being broken to water tanks not being inspected. Uh, there is a crisis in public housing and one that needs to be fixed. Uh, I'm going later today uh, to meet uh, with constituents, with the Tenant Association President Darlene Waters and folks in the building at Elliott Chelsea Houses in my district. Frank Runyon mentioned in his piece that he spoke to a resident, as you, as you just said, uh, uh, that had seen discolored water in her apartment a few days a month. We're not sure if that is directly related to the water tower issues, which is why uh, Vito Masachulo, the general manager of NYCHA, will be at that meeting later today on site with me and tenants in that senior building that the inspection came from, as well as the Tenant Association president to talk about that. I can't make an assurance. I don't want to make an assurance. And I can't make an assurance because I, you know, I'm not a health professional. I wish I could, you know. The Department of Health and NYCHA need to ensure that every person who lives in public housing, and not just public housing, but public housing and any type of housing in New York City can have confidence in their drinking water that it is not contaminated in any way which is why we're having the meeting at Elliott Chelsea Houses later on today to try to bring that clarity to those residents who live in that building. And I, I'm sure I'll see you there. Yes, yeah. yeah. Rich, and then Jeff, and then Rosa. One of the um, threats and incidents that happened at ACS a few days ago uh, that we didn't hear, uh, you actually see the incendiary folks who used genuine lamps in the air. Uh, Unacceptable. Yes, they should. It's uh, totally unacceptable. It's indefensible that someone uh, who was convicted of murder at one point was interacting with a six-year-old child. Completely unacceptable, indefensible. They need to go back and ensure that there's no one else working at ACS with any violent criminal history or a history that could endanger a child that is working at ACS. Uh, the chair of the General Welfare Committee has been working on this uh, and getting a lot of updates on it, so I'm gonna let Steve say something on it. Um, so I, I was able to talk to the ACS commissioner last night to get um, some questions answered. Uh, <clears throat> so first off, just some clarity. Um, this individual was hired during the Bloomberg administration, uh, in the final months of the Bloomberg administration, and was cleared for civil service by DCAS, um, uh, not by ACS. So the clearance was from DCAS originally. So the understanding is that even if you go to the Justice Center, a conviction of a crime, uh, even like murder, apparently under their current rules, I believe, or at least their rules at the time, <clears throat> would have allowed uh, an individual with that criminal history crazy. to go through. <clears throat> well, that I, that I can't speak to. I mean, Okay. I mean, one thing that I'll say is that um, I, I agree with the speaker that it's it's totally unacceptable, um, and that the current commissioner, uh, Commissioner Hansel, a year ago when he came in, 
um, changed this policy, he saw it on his own as a potential problem and, and went ahead and changed the policy, um, at least when I spoke to him last night, not prompted by a specific incident, but in fact, uh, just as a matter of policy and procedure. So they're going to be uh, re-examining the policy of looking at other people that may have uh, have similar criminal records to see if uh, within, you know, as, as an employee of ACS. Um, but, uh, you know, the policy itself uh, has been in place for over, I believe, at least a year now um, that would have not allowed this to happen in the first place. Um, but I agree with Speaker Johnson, totally unacceptable. Jeff? We've referred it to the NYPD, and the NYPD is is on this. I don't want to share any more about it, but Councilman Rodriguez did receive some extremely threatening uh, messages, some death threats uh, related to this, and we immediately, upon him alerting myself, and it happened over the weekend, uh, I immediately got on the phone, and the police commissioner and the intelligence division were notified right away. I don't have any update to share on it, but I was told that they were acting immediately to identify who the person was and to go out and ensure that Councilman Rodriguez uh, would feel safe and protected. But the threat that I saw that was shown to me was a very real threat uh, on Councilman Rodriguez, and it was a death threat. And I, I can't, I can't comment what the PD has done, but they were alerted literally two minutes after I got the message from Councilor Rodriguez, and and I haven't gotten an update from them. I don't know if he has, but it's something that you know, unacceptable. You cannot threaten anyone uh, in New York City with violence. Rosa. Um, Councilor Diaz just reported his different here, different seizure. I mean, is, is that the fundamental difference between Washington and I, I, this is very nice of him to say, but I don't think that's true. Um, uh, I think that either d the dynamics were different, the landscape was different. I'm someone who has publicly said that I wasn't supportive three years ago of Stevie Bill, uh, and because of the changing dynamics and the upheaval in the industry, my mind was changed over the course of three years. So I can't totally exactly remember what the dynamic was three years ago in all the nuanced ways, but I would say a lot has changed. The driver's suicides, I think, really showed the human impact of this in a very tragic and heartbreaking way. The number of new licenses on the road, the exacerbated congestion over the last three years, those are major, major, major factors. And uh, I wasn't in the conversations with Speaker Mark Viverito on how she decided to not move forward with that bill, but I think that she, she she was trying to listen to the members, um, and, and that's what happened. But uh, I wouldn't say that we're only doing this now because you have a new speaker. I think that the dynamics of the industry have changed quite a bit. Uh, let me take Katie and Samar, and then we're done. Katie. Yes. Well, and I said this yesterday to the to the Daily News editorial board when they were asking me just kind of about land use generally and um, whether it be Councilmember Rivera with the Union Square Tech Hub or Councilmember Rodriguez with the Inwood rezoning or Councilmember Cabrera and Gibson on the Jerome Avenue rezoning in the Bronx, I, I look at my process, re I look at my part here is if it's not happening in my district, and it is not a, a citywide issue, or there's not a facility or a building that is gonna have a huge citywide impact, you know, I think my job is to really support the council members on trying to achieve what they're trying to achieve for their community. And at that time, when I said that to, to Brian on the radio show, um, which was not this last time I was on, but the time before, uh, I said that because Idanis was telling me that he wasn't making a lot of progress 
with the Department of City Planning or the Economic Development Corporation on getting things that he thought were necessary to move this towards the finish line. So part of, I think, my job is not to be involved every step of the way. I think council members uh, need to have some um, proprietary ownership to these things that are going on in their district, and there are so many of them. I don't actually know if I would have the time to be involved in every single one, but towards the end of the process, when a council member comes to me and says, can you please speak to uh, Chair Lago or President uh, you know, of EDC or the mayor directly, can you please do that for me? I look at my role here is to help in that. And so at that moment in time when I said that, Idanis was telling me much progress hadn't been made. And since that time, he was able to make more progress. And when he called me and asked me to step in and make phone calls, I did that. Same with Councilmember Rivera on the Union Square Tech Hub. Same with Council Members Cabrera and Gibson on Jerome Avenue. So that's kind of how, how the, the process has unfolded, at least in the first seven months here. Uh, Samar. It's a bit of a tangential question. Okay. But the Hudson Yards funding that you were just mentioning. Yes. So you want me to answer the BQX or Hudson Yards BQ. question? BQ. BQ. On BQX, not on Hudson Yards. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I am a big supporter of the BQX. I think it's an important project, um, but I also think that there are uh, concerns that need to be hammered out between the council members, and there are seven council members whose districts are affected by it. Menchaca, Levin, Lander, Cumbo, Van Bramer, Constantinides, and I might be missing one. Um, but uh, each each neighborhood that it stretches through, there are gonna be some local concerns that matter. Um, I think the project is a, is a good project, and I think if there's a creative way to finance it, um, that of course doesn't take away from much needed money for the subway system, um, I think we should explore those. I, I have had a few meetings with the folks who have um, been involved in the BQX, and they've been updating me on the project, but I'm not, I would say, an expert on it. I'm not on the ground in the neighborhoods and communities that are gonna be served by it, and I haven't been involved in all the conversations from the very beginning when it was first talked about in the Mayor's State of the City, I think in 2015, I believe, uh, either 2014 or 2015, anyway, when he unveiled it, I was just a council member then who, thought it was a cool project in Brooklyn, but didn't know much about it. Um, so again, I wanna, of course, respect uh, the, all the council members whose districts are affected, and I think that the, the what would you call it, the nonprofit uh, that has been running this has been working with their offices and trying to keep them updated. Task force. There's a task force, which, uh, you know, uh, Council Member Menchaca is, uh, is the chair of, uh, but um, I don't know enough about the financing to comment it on a, on a substantive way. I can look into it and get back to you, but I don't want to give you an answer. I want to look at the details on it first. Uh, thank you. Let me take Rosa and then we're done. So I, th I can talk about it generally, and I can only talk about it from my own experience for projects in, in my district where I've had to work with EDC or HPD on RFPs for city-owned sites or other sites. So I'll tell you that, at least from my perspective, I have been in pretty early with uh, EDC and HPD uh, when they've identified a site and they're looking at an RFP to put out, and one of the things that um, I've done it, I think it's made HPD and EDC actually a little crazy, is I've tried to create on these sites that even are gonna have a ULERP process down the line to create a very process-oriented 
pre-certification EULA process that includes community board involvement, uh, local block association involvement, stakeholder involvement, to understand what those actual needs are. I can't comment upon that if that happened on this site, but I would say that, you know, there's a site that uh, Sally has written uh, a bunch about called the Slaughterhouse site next to the Javits Center. And during that, we've had like an extensive um, pre euler process with EDC. It, I want it to be 100%, but that's part of what the process has been about, which is if you make it 100%, what do you lose from it? If you made it 80%, what would you gain from it? The height, how high should it be? The retail, should it be the affordable supermarket? Do we need pre-K seats? So every site's a little different. On the projects in, in, in my district, I have tried to create uh, a very extensive, transparent community review process on these sites so people feel a significant amount of buy-in before the EULA application even gets certified. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.